All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James over here with you, and we're glad that you are ready for another study in God's Word. I hope that you are. We encourage you to get your pen and paper ready to jot down notes and uh, study along with us from the Bible. You know, friends, uh, this is a program where you can freely ask questions and you can call in. This is a live calling program, and we'll be glad to hear from you. If you have a question about anything that we're saying, or maybe you have another question, another related topic, we'll certainly entertain those as well. But um, today, what we're going to be discussing is some, some information that I think will help you in your daily Bible studies. And if you're, if you're doing a daily Bible study, uh, and I hope that you are, but what we're going to help you do is not just learn about one thing today, we're going to help you learn about uh, everything in the sense of how to study the Bible. And I, and I can assure you, friends, if you put these things in practice and we're going to go through a Bible study that's related to some questions that have been being asked of me, and so we're going to just do a Bible study on this particular topic. <clears throat> but what I'm going to give you today, friends, is going to help you in all of your Bible studies. And I think that when we're done here, I think that you will see that, that this is um, how good information this, this can be. Uh, I don't remember uh, where it, uh, uh, how, how the exact phrase was, but I heard a, a, a chef say one time that if you learn how to cook a recipe, if you follow a recipe, you, uh, you know how to make one dish, but if you learn uh, procedures, or if you, if you learn um, I can't remember the word now that he he said. Um, if you if you learn methods, maybe it, that was it. Maybe if you learn methods, you can cook thousands of dishes, and so that's really it's really true. Uh, if you learn some basic techniques, so you you actually are a better you become a better cook than simply just following a recipe. You you can uh, you know learn how to uh, sear and grill and braise and bake and roast and all, all these different things that's still just following the recipe so look at 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 uh, cooking as a sense of well if I learn different methods cooking methods and different techniques then I certainly will be a better uh, uh, cook than just you know be able to follow the recipe same the same is true with with the Bible if you learn how to study the Bible and you know Paul said in second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a word that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you learn how to rightly divide the word of truth, then it will help you in all aspects of your Bible study. And not just learning about one topic. And oftentimes that's, that's what people do. They try to, they look at the Bible and say, well, I'm just going to study this one topic. And they don't really know how to study that one topic. And so they don't even do a very good job of studying that one topic because they come to so many wrong conclusions. And so not only do they not know the, what the Bible has to say about this one particular topic, but they also don't know how to find out what the Bible has to say about other topics because they don't know the techniques. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a technique today that I think will help you in your Bible study if you'll simply follow it. And like I said, the reason why um, we're going to be talking about these things is because uh, I've been being asked some questions uh, having to do with baptism, and I just want to read uh, some of them to you. This is um, a question that, that comes to me. I don't know that I'll actually get into answering this question, but just to show you that it is uh, uh, related uh, to the topic. Um, hey, James, help me understand. I know that we baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, verse 19. Um, but the Pentecostals, in explaining that, they say it's a direct, uh, uh, let's see, the Pentecostal, when I state that to the Pentecostals in explaining that, that is a direct command from our Lord of the Great Commission. My question is why have they made this a doctrine? And he starts talking about being baptized in the name of. So there's something related to baptism there. And so there's a, a topic that if you're studying baptism, you're going to come across that. And you're going to have to know, well, what does the Bible really have to say about this particular uh, subject? 
uh, and that aspect of baptism. Here's another question. Um, let's see, no, this is not it. Here's another uh, question that was asked of me uh, regarding uh, baptism. Let me get down here to it. Uh, here's one that says, this lady actually sent me a, a video of a, another preacher talking about baptism. Uh, she says, I'm confused about this. Is he right? And then she said, here's a link. Um, here's this man. He's, it's, the name of his lesson is called, Is Water Baptism Necessary for Salvation? I have to be honest with you. It made a little sense. Um, um, but I need uh, your opinion slash scripture uh, on this matter. So, uh, you know, when people are asking these questions, it means all right, there's, a, there's an answer that can be found. If we have the right tools, we'll know how to answer it. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to help try to answer some of these questions by giving you some tools that will not only answer questions about baptism, but also answer some questions about any other Bible subject topic that you that you have and how to go about finding the answers by rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's really what we're going to get into today here on A Word from the Lord. Friends, Word from the Lord is, is brought to you by the Church of Christ. We meet at 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And if you would like to reach me, you can, uh, let me give you some content information here. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. Uh, 276 340 2653. 276 340 2653. If you want to reach me, and if you want to be on this program, here's the phone number where you can call in and ask your question this afternoon. It's area code 336. And the phone number is 427-9696. That's 427-WMYN. 427-9696. 427-9696. Or 627-9563. 627-9563. 627-WLOE. And that is how you can be a part of the program today. Now, Okay, friends, so get your pen and paper out, and uh, we're going to, I'm going to give you uh, one, two, three, six things, six things, a list of six steps, really, for a good topical Bible study, and I don't know where I got this, I, 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 I know it's not original with me, um, I may have renamed some of these steps, but um, I really don't remember where I got it from, but it's not... Uh, uh, it's, that's really not important, I don't guess. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't claim for this to be original with me. I uh, had an original thought one time and it hurt so much that uh, I quit trying. But these are some six steps that if you follow them, you will, you'll be able to, to study just about any Bible topic that you, that you want to study. The first step, the first step is to compile. And what, what I mean by that is, if you're going to study a topic, and let's say for, for today's lesson we're going to be talking about baptism, if you'll just go through, think about words that have to do with baptism that you may find in the Bible. All right, List synonyms and antonyms, uh, words that, that you might uh, come across. So like if we're talking about baptism, you might want to consider words like dip or immerse or maybe wash. Uh, of course, you're going to look at words like baptisms, baptizing, uh, baptized. Um, you know, different variations of of the of the same root word. And so, just make a list of these words because you're going to look them up. You're going to look them up in your concordance. And friends, if you don't have a concordance, uh, strong concordance, I really encourage you to get one. Uh, we actually used to give these away uh, a number of years ago. But today, I mean, you can get these concordances on, I mean, on your phone, you can get them on your laptop, your tablets, or, I mean, any kind of technology, you can get these, um, um, the, the study helps, you know, strong concordance or whatever. I actually have a, a DVD that, uh, actually, I may have one or two of them that if you would like one, if you'll give me a call and tell me you'd want one, I'll, I'll first come, first serve, give you what, you, what I have left. But uh, I have one. It's, it's the program that I use uh, in my teaching. And, and uh, if you come to uh, uh, down the boulevard where we're studying the Bible, then you, you'll see the Bible program up on the screen, and that's what we've always used. And that has a concordance in it, and it will help you search 
for all of these words. And so it's, it really, really is a time-saving feature that will help uh, uh, expedite or speed up your, your Bible study. So you want to compile all these words that you're going to be looking up. Synonyms, uh, you know, similar words that we're talking about. Like we said, baptizing, baptized, baptizeth, um, baptized, baptism, baptisms, uh, washings, dip, uh, plunge, whatever you might think of. You might think of some words that, that may or may not be important to your study, but you're, you're thinking of these because you want to cover all your bases. See, the problem people have when they're studying the Bible, friends, is they don't really cover all their bases a lot of times. And I would say the only thing worse than studying a Bible topic uh, is, uh, or not studying a Bible topic, the only, the only thing that's worse than not studying a Bible topic is not studying a Bible topic completely and getting the right answer for it. I mean, you may not know the answer to a Bible question, but if you don't study it completely, you may come up with a completely wrong answer. And so um, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a terrible thing as well. So the first step you're going to do is compile. You're going to make this list of, of words. Then the second one that thing you're going to do is you're going to collect. And when I say collect, I mean you're going to look up all the verses that are related to this topic. Now, friends, you know, so I, I think this is going to, I, I chuckle when I say this because oftentimes people say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say much about baptism. Uh, and... And so it's really not important. Friends, have you ever done a, that, that's spoken like someone who has never done a, a study on baptism. Because if you do an exhaustive study on baptism, you're going to come up with hundreds of verses that have to do with baptism. Now, that may, may not all be the baptism that is required for us to be saved, but there is a, there's a great many verses that have to do with baptism or baptisms or washings and things like that, that I think most people don't even know are in the Bible. And so when you, but when you look up these verses, when you do your, your step number two, collect, and you look up all these verses on this, on this uh, subject, you're going to start realizing, Hey man, this is, there's a lot of information here that maybe I haven't considered. And it may be overwhelming depending on, you know, the topic you're studying. So, so you look up all these verses and, and friends, you should think when you're looking up these verses, uh, you're going to be reading them obviously to find out the context and you're going to be, uh, you know, reading even more than just the one verse. You're going to be reading a verse before and a verse after it. So you're going to be doing a lot of Bible study. You're going to be getting a lot of reading in. A lot of, 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 of searching of the scriptures just because you're searching out what the Bible has to say about this matter. And friends, that's really why God designed it this way. You know, Isaiah said that God revealed his will here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, uh, here a little, there a little. And it's because, so sometimes you have to dig, you have to search through the whole, the whole Bible to find everything you need. And then... You, you put all the pieces together. So you compile the, a list and then you collect all the verses that are related to the topic. Now the third step is you're going to consider. And what that is, you, and you observe, you take notes. And you start looking at each one of these verses. And that's why I'm saying when, if you do some study on, on a subject, like say for instance baptism, which is what we're going to be looking at today. When you, when you look at all these verses, friends, you're going to be getting a lot of information that I will, uh, trust me, you're going, you're going to be surprised at the information that you didn't know about baptism uh, from the Bible that, that you, uh, you know, you're just going to be surprised at how much you don't know about baptism. Most people think there's just one or two verses about baptism, but I mean, there's, there's a whole lot in the Bible about baptism and a lot of insight that you're going to get from reading these these uh, these scriptures and, and uh, studying them. So so the first thing you do is you're going to compile, you're going to collect, number two. Number three, you're going to consider, take notes on them. And then number four is you're going to compare. And by compare, what I mean is you're going to put some verses together with other verses because they go together. Uh, they're complementing verses, maybe verses that, that give you some insight uh, or that are related to... Um, uh, 
uh, one another. For example, this is the illustration I used this morning. In, uh, in Ephesians 5 and verse 19, now this is a different subject here, but in Ephesians 5, 19, when we're talking about singing, the Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing can make a melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, if you're studying singing, you're studying music in the New Testament church, you're going to come across this verse that says Ephesians 5, 19, that says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing can make a melody in your heart to your Lord. And there is a... a companion verse or a complementing verse, a verse that gives you uh, similar information in Colossians 3 and verse 16. Now I know you've heard us use these verses together and that's that's because they go together, they they, they tie together or they give us uh, information that's very similar so we put them together, Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ Dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So, so there's two verses that, that go together. Now, back to our study. We're doing baptism. Now, when you start looking at all these verses on baptism, you're going to start putting verses together that complement each other. In other words, they're, they're going to be on the same topic. For example, you're going to find a whole lot of verses on John's baptism. Because in in the the New Testament, when you start reading straight through Matthew, you're gonna you're gonna meet John. All right, you, you, the birth of Jesus. Then in in uh, in Matthew three, you have John, the baptizer. Now, one of the words you're gonna look up, one of the words you're gonna look up in your study is gonna be Baptist. All right, and you're gonna find John the Baptist. And so there's going to be a there's going to be a good little uh, serendipitous uh, learning to this study, you know, as a benefit, a benefit that you didn't expect. That's what serendipitous means. It means you're going to have a benefit, and that is when you look up the word Baptist in the Bible. Guess what you're going to find? Well, guess what you're not going to find? You're not going to find Baptist Church. See, you're studying baptism, and so you're going to look up Baptist because everybody knows John, John the Baptist. But it's not going to be anything about the Baptist Church. You're going to learn something about John, all right. But one thing you will never see is Baptist Church. So you're learning something as you go through this about even another subject. So, but you put all these complementing verses together. So John the baptizer, John was a John was baptizing and. You got people coming to him for his baptism. You got uh, individuals that are being baptized with John, and so you're gonna put all of them over here in this one little corner uh, on another little sheet of paper. Maybe and maybe that's what you do. Maybe you have a sheet of paper and you say, "Okay, I'm, I'm seeing something about John's baptism," and so you start you start putting them together. So any verse that talks about John's baptism or John uh, baptizing someone, you're gonna write that down. You're gonna you're gonna put that verse together. So you'll put Matthew three uh, down where. John was baptizing, and the Pharisees came to him. Matthew three and verse eight. And you're going to talk. You're going to read in um, um, uh, Acts nineteen, where um, Paul found some people that had obeyed John's baptism. All right. Uh, you're going to find Acts eighteen, where the man named Apollos uh, he was teaching people, knowing only John's baptism. So you see, you're going to put all these all these together. And when you're doing this study, you're going to find out, hey, I know what Apollos was teaching because I did a study on baptism, and man, I found a whole lot about John's baptism. So you're putting all these together. So that's step number four. Step number five is condense. All right, so we've got compile number one, collect number two, consider number three, compare number four, and then condense. And by condensing, you're putting all your notes into an outline. You're kind of organizing them. So that we have some, you know, so we can have some kind of understanding about what we're learning, what we're, what we're, uh, what we're seeing as we study. And friends, I, I submit to you that there's a there's a reason why a lot of people don't fully understand any particular Bible topic is because they don't organize their notes. They don't they don't look to see what verses go together, and does one verse give some uh, insight to another verse. Uh, I like to say a divine commentary is one verse a divine commentary on another verse, and so they don't they don't they don't put them together 
and and sift through them and see which ones go with, with which ones. Uh, it's it's sort of like uh, I used this illustration uh, this morning in, uh, in in the lesson. Uh, it's sort of like going through your closet. Now, ladies, uh, you, you like to go through your closets, and you know y'all like to take the summer clothes and the winter clothes and the fall clothes, and you know you wear your white shoes here before or after Labor Day, whatever it is. I don't know. Uh, I have a one pair of boots. I have two pair of boots, and you know wear them year round. So. Uh, but when you're going through your closet, you're sorting through all the clothes, you know, the clothes, you know, you got, you got your blouses over here and your dresses over here and your, your sweaters over here and, and so forth. Well, that's what you're doing with these Bible notes. You're putting them in different places. And then, and then the last thing is the conclusion. That is where you make a conclusion. You come to a conclusion about all your findings. You put them into a practical application. All right, what then does the Bible say about this subject matter? I, I started off at the very beginning. I looked up every verse I know to look up on this topic. I've collected them all. I've, I've sorted them all. I've read all these verses, and now I'm coming to a conclusion. And friends, let me just say this. When you look up these words in the Bible, especially on baptism, for example, uh, let, me just, let me just give you some numbers here. If you were to do a, a study on baptism, you would find 22 uh, matches, uh, 22, 22 verses that have the word baptism in it, in the Bible. 22. Now, you're going to have nine verses that have the word baptize in it. And you're going to have four that have the word baptizing. And you're going to have two with the word baptizeth. All right, E-T-H. If you're using the King James, you know there's a lot of those E-T-H's in there, right? Baptizeth. So you've got baptizing, baptize, bapti uh, uh, baptism, baptize, baptizing, baptizeth. But that's not all. You've got baptized 61 times. Uh, you've got uh, washing a couple of times, and you've got baptisms uh, once, right? You got washing or washings three times, baptisms uh, one time. Then you also are going to have the word dip, dipped, dip and dipped a couple of times. And they're all from the same word. Now, that's why I'm giving you these words, because they're all from the same root word, which is uh, baptizo or bapto, which to means immerse or to dip repeatedly, submerge. And so when you're starting to look up these words, all of a sudden you're realizing, you know, there's some words that are in the Bible that actually mean baptism that are not translated baptism, like the word washing. In Mark 7, verse 4, uh, Jesus was talking to, about the traditions of the elders. And some of their traditions had to do with the washings of pots and cups. And that's the same word That's the same word that you find in Hebrews 6, 2, where Paul talks about the doctrine of baptisms. So the doctrine of washings, all right? diverse washings, uh, Hebrews 9, and verse 10. And so you're starting to realize, hey, there are some words that maybe I didn't realize go in the study. And so that's what gives me a little, uh, um, you know, broadens my study. Man, I need to start looking up these words, find out what these words mean. And a good concordance will give you a definition, and a strong concordance will tell you what the word means, and it will tell you how it is translated. All right? And now that's really important because as you're reading through the Bible, you may not know, hey, this is the word for baptism because it really just says washing. But a concordance will, will, give, you that, will give you that word. Now, uh, strong, your strong concordance will give you a number. So if you don't know all the Greek words or the Hebrew words, uh, you can just go by the number. For example, baptism is 908 and baptize is 907 and uh, baptized is is 907 as well. Uh, washing or baptisms is 909. 
and dip or dipped is 9-11, but they all come from the same root word. They all come from the same word, baptiz baptizo or bapto, which means to dip or immerse or submerge and things like that. So uh, this is why I'm saying, friends, as you do your study, you're going to start expanding your knowledge about this word. Now, so so here's what we've done. So we we did step one and step two here. We compiled and we collected and we looked up all these words and we, we looked up baptism, baptism, baptizing, bap, uh, baptizeth and so forth. And now we're going to have to consider all that we have, all that we found. Now, friends, if you're taking notes on each one of these verses, you're going to realize that, man, there are a lot of different baptisms in the New Testament. Now, <clears throat> I know most of you probably know a few of them. I could ask you, how many baptisms are there mentioned in the New Testament? And you could probably name a few. Somebody would probably say, well, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's one. There's a baptism of fire. Okay, that's two. There's John's baptism, which we've already talked about. There's three. Uh, can you talk about another one? Now, somebody might say, well, there's water baptism, but it's not really important. Well, whether it's important or not, let's just let's put it in there. There's four. So you've got four uh, of baptisms that are mentioned in the Bible. But did you know, friends, there's, there's a baptism of suffering? which the word means to overwhelm or completely submerge. You're, you're submerged in, in uh, uh, pain and suffering. Matthew 20 and verse 22, Jesus said, Can you be baptized with the baptism uh, which I'm baptized with? And they said, Yeah, we can. So that, that's what we're talking about, baptism of suffering. So there's five. Then you've got in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, Paul talks about a baptism for the dead. Now, uh, I believe that's the idea of being baptized uh, in preparation for dying. That's not talking about the Mormon idea of being baptized uh, for someone who is already dead. So maybe we shouldn't count that one as uh, as one, even though it, it kind of sometimes gets put by itself. And of course, then you've got the Great Commission baptism. Go into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And, of course, then you have that baptism of cups and pots that we read in Mark 7 and verse 4 through 8. Now, see, probably, friends, if, you, if you're studying this, you probably had no idea that the Bible talked about baptism, baptizing a cup. But that's what we're talking about. When you wash your dishes, you put your plate down in, in the soapy suds, you know, the soapy water. Yeah, you're baptizing it. Now, it's not to, it's not to remove sin, it's to remove, you know, scraps. It's to remove all the, the, the food stuck on it. But it's still a, a baptism in the sense of it is an immersion. All right? So when we're talking about a baptism, we're talking about immersion. We're talking about dipping. So uh, so when we're looking at this, now we've got a list of all these different baptisms. Baptism of fire, baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptism of John's baptism. Uh, there's a baptism of Moses, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 1 and 2. Uh, they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. Uh, the Great Commission baptism, the baptism of, of cups and pots. So, But when we get to Ephesians 4, uh, when we get to Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 5, now most of you know the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So in my study of the word of, or the topic of baptism, I'm going to come across Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Now I've got to figure out well, which one is the one baptism. Paul said there's one baptism, but in my studies, I've, I've picked out at least seven, maybe eight, depending on how I categorize them. So which one is the one baptism? Because there's, there's definitely more than one that are mentioned in the New Testament. See, but that's what a Bible study does. The Bible study helps you ask some questions that you have to say, well, I need to figure out the answer to this. Well, uh, so... My, my first question that I'm asking is, what's the one baptism? And maybe if I ask another question, I'll know something about baptism. Like, well, maybe I should find out what is baptism. What is a baptism in general? Well, generally speaking, it, it is an immersion. It's an immersion. Um, it's, it's to, you dip something, right? You dip something in... Uh, 
let me just go back to this verse. Uh, in John 13 and verse 26, John 13 and verse 26, listen to what Jesus said. Now, here's the word. <clears throat> here's, here's the word that comes from our, the word we're, we're talking about, bapto, which, which means to cover wholly, completely with the fluid. John 13, uh, 26, Jesus was asked, you know, who is it that's going to betray you? You know, P Peter, uh, Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it was of whom he spake. Then he, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. So he dipped the sop. When he dipped his bread, what did Jesus do with his bread? He baptized it. Well, that's what the word means. He, he, he submerged it. He covered it in liquid. That's what you do, friends. I know some of you out there eating your cornbread and your buttermilk, right? What are you doing? You're baptizing that cornbread. You're baptizing that cornbread in a big old cup of buttermilk. Well, that's not the one baptism. You may like that baptism, you may like baptism that way, but that's not the baptism that we're talking about. But I'm showing you, that gives you a picture of what a baptism is. It is a dipping. It is a completely covering in a liquid. All right? Now, friends, you just can't be baptized by sprinkling or pouring. All right? So you, you've got to be immersed is what, the, is what the Bible says. It's a burial. Romans uh, 6 and verse 3. So when you're doing your, your study on on uh, baptism, you're going to come across Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, where Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism. So baptism is a burial. It is an immersion. So we're learning something about the picture of baptism, just in general, the picture of baptism. Uh, in John 3 and verse 23, required much water. John the baptizer was baptizing uh, in the river because the Bible says there was much water there. John came baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now, friends, when someone says, well, I don't need much water to be baptized because I'm just going to be sprinkled. Well, Number one, sprinkling is not an immersion. Therefore, it is not a baptism. Sprinkling is sprinkling. And baptism is baptism. Now, you can call baptism, you can call sprinkling baptism, but it's not, right? I mean, you can, you can call something by another name, but that doesn't mean that's what it is. Right? I mean, you, you can call your, that that Ford Pinto that you're driving out there, you can call it a Lamborghini all you want to. <laughs> it's not what it is. You know? I'd like to see you put that on uh, on Craigslist. You know, tell everybody, well, you got a, you got a 2019 Lamborghini. You know, 2018 Lamborghini. And brand brand spanking new and then put a picture of your pinto up there and the people say, Well, that's not that's not a Lamborghini. Oh sure it is. I that's what I call it. I call it a Lamborghini. Well you can call it all you want to. That's not what it is. And so you can call sprinkling baptism all you want to, but that's not what it is. Baptism is an immersion. Baptism is a burial. Baptism requires much water. I had a preacher call him one time and told me he said, Well I could baptize somebody on her deathbed. I said, How are you gonna do that? He said, I'll, I'll sprinkle them. Sprinkling is not baptism. Well, you can get them really wet. Well, really wet doesn't mean you have buried them. Now, when I'm studying in the Bible, when I'm studying the Bible on baptism, guess what I come across? I come across Acts chapter 8 and verse 38, and I find Philip and the eunuch. And I read verse 38 where it says, He commanded the chair to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Philip baptized the eunuch when they went down into the water. And in verse 39 says, and when they were come up out of the water. So baptism requires going down into 
water. Now, friends, you most people who are sprinkled, I don't know that people who are sprinkled, I mean, why would you want to get into the water if you're just going to have some water flicked on your face? I mean, why would you want to be, why would you go into the water if if the, the priest or whoever's going to pour a little water on top of your head? Why would you do that? But now, if you were going to be totally immersed in the water, you would go down into the water and you would come up out of the water. And one reason why you come up out of the water is because you have been buried in the water. That it's a, it's a coming forth. All right? In uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 9, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan and straightway coming up out of the water. So he comes up out of the water because he has been brought forth out of a watery grave. He has been buried in water and he was brought forth. That is why that's why baptism is a burial. And friends, people say I've been people who say that they have been buried with Christ, but say they have not been baptized. You know, you cannot be buried with Christ if you have not been baptized. If you haven't been brought forth out of the water, you can say, well, I had some water flicked on my face. Well, you didn't come up out of anything. See, that's what a resurrection is. Raised together. Romans 6, verse um, uh, 7, Paul says, if we have, uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, uh, 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Well, because we've, we've come forth. We, we're raised from the dead the water grave of baptism. So when I'm reading, when I'm doing my little Bible study, when I'm doing my word study on baptism, I learn something about baptism. I know it's an immersion. I know it's a burial. I know that uh, a person has to go into the water and come out of the water and that it requires much water. All right? And so I, I'm learning something about just the, the basic general idea of a baptism. And so now I know what to look for when someone says, well, I've been baptized. Well, that was not a baptism, you know. If, if, if baptism is just having a little water uh, flicked on you, well, you know, my car was baptized coming up here to the station today because it got a few drops of rain on it. Well, now that might be what the Methodists call a baptism, but that's not what the Bible calls a baptism. I don't want to baptize my car. If I baptize my car, it's probably not going to run because it's going to be at the bottom of the lake or something. See? So I'm not going to baptize my car. But uh, the Bible has given me a picture about what baptism is. Now, what does it accomplish? What does baptism accomplish? Now, the Bible is going to tell me something about the one baptism. Now, now, remember, I'm trying to find what that one baptism is. Well, Peter tells me in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21... He says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Baptism saves us. And he said it's, it's like Noah, excuse me, uh, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that his eight souls, were saved by water. Saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So baptism is water. Water baptism saves us. Now, I'm not saying we're saved by water baptism alone. I, w I would never say that. But I'm saying it's part of God's plan. And if someone says that it's not, well, then they haven't obviously done any study on the Bible. Now, in Acts 2 verse 38, I read that baptism is for the remission of sins. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent, be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Paul was told in Acts 22, verse 16, why tearest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So I'm learning in connection with baptism, I'm learning what it does. I'm learning it, it's, that it's water, that it saves, that it's a burial, that it is uh, uh, that it washes away sins, that it puts you into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. Galatians 3, 27. Paul says that 
uh, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So baptism is the door into Christ or into the body. All right, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, baptized by one spirit into one body. Now someone says, well, that's a spirit baptism. Well, wait a minute. Are you sure? How do you know that? If you're doing a study on baptism, and I'm reading that baptism, water baptism is what saves, and that uh, it's, it's for the remission of sins, that it washes away sins, that it puts me into Christ, and that the body of Christ is what's going to be saved, Ephesians 5, verse 20, uh, 5, 5, verse 23, if I, if I read that the, the body is what's going to be saved, and I'm baptized into one body by one spirit, I'm, I'm going to put that with, with water baptism. It's connected with a baptism that is a burial that washes away sins, that's for the remission of sins. And so I'm learning something about what baptism does or what, it, what it's connected to. Now, we still have to, we still have to put some of these verses together now. So we have a general idea of what baptism is. We put some verses together. And so I'm trying to find what is that one baptism. Well, I've ruled out what one baptism. I'm ruled out the one baptism being uh, the baptism of Moses. All right, I've ruled out the baptism being the baptism of fire. I've ruled out the one baptism being uh, washing of, of cups and pots. All right, so yeah, I'm pretty confident that that's not the one baptism that uh, has to be done in order to... Uh, be saved. I mean, they didn't say, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, well, go home and wash dishes. No, he didn't say that. <clears throat> so, I, I've ruled down some things about this one baptism. And so now I'm putting them all together. I'm putting some of these verses together. And I put all the verses about John's baptism together. And I put the verses about the uh, Great Commission baptism. I put them together. And I, maybe I put some verses about the Holy Spirit baptism together. And so now I'm condensing, I'm organizing, and I'm finding out, all right, which one is which? Which one is which? Now, what is the one baptism? Okay, let me give you a phone number, because I know I'm, I'm zipping through this, and I didn't stop to give you a phone, a phone numbers in case you want to call in, but the area code is 336, and the phone number is 427-9696, 427-9696-427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-9663. 9563-627-WLOE, or you can call me at 276-340-2653, um, 276-340-2653, and we'll get you on the program. So, now, here's what we've, what we've done. We've collected, we've, uh, we've compiled, we've collected, we've considered... Uh, We've categorized, and now we're coming down to condensing. We're putting all these scriptures that we've sifted through, and we're putting them together, and we found out, you know what, there's a lot of baptism mentioned in the Bible, but they are, there are some that are obviously not the one baptism. But what, what might be the one baptism? Well, let's look at John's baptism. I mean, John's baptism was authorized by God. In Matthew 21, verse 25, uh, Jesus was asked by what authority did he do some things, and he said, well, I'll ask you a question, and if you can answer me, then I'll tell you by whose authority I do things. He said the baptism of John, which was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, why did you not then believe him? And if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. All right, so John's baptism was from heaven. It was from God. It was from God. And, and by the way, I, I hate to chase a rabbit here, but by the way, friends, Jesus said, talks about John's baptism, whether from heaven or from men, and they reasoned with themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say unto us, why then did you not believe him? Why would Jesus say, why didn't you believe John? If his baptism was from heaven, why did they say, why didn't you believe him? Why wouldn't they say, well, if we said it's from heaven, then why weren't you baptized? 
But instead, they said, Jesus would ask us, why would we not believe John? They put belief for baptism. Because if you truly believe something, you're going to be baptized. All right? So when people say, well, saved by faith only, no. You can be saved by faith, but if you believe, it's going to include doing what God says, which in this case would be being baptized. Okay. That's just a little excursion there. So John's baptism was authorized by John by, by God. It was authorized by God. John was sent to baptize. Uh, John 1 verse 33. Uh, he actually said, He that sent me to baptize. And if you obey John's baptism in Luke 7, uh, Luke 7 verse 29 says that the people who obey John justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So if you if you were baptized with John's baptism, you were actually obeying God. And it was for remission of sins. Mark 1 verse 4. It was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, here's the question. Is that the baptism for us today? Well, no. Here's why. Because in all of our studying, as we're studying John's baptism, we know that it was for Israel. It was for the Jews only. Uh, Acts 13, 24, John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. John's baptism is not for us today. It was only for Israel. It was to prepare the people for, for the Christ who would come after him. He was preparing the way, uh, Luke 1, 17 and verse 76. So, it was only for Israel, and that's why that's why Paul told the uh, the folks in Ephesus in John in Acts nineteen. He said John's bap John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So we know that John's baptism is not the one baptism. Now someone said, well, what about the Holy Ghost baptism? You got to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, let's let's wait a minute. Let's go back and let's look at our notes. Now, we did come across a lot of verses that had to do with Holy Spirit baptism. But here's what we noticed. As we're doing our study, we came across Acts 1 and verse 5. Acts 1 and verse 5 is uh, Jesus talking to, his, uh, talking to his apostles, right? They were all assembled together. And Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Father, which... He said, "Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the apostles. He's talking to the apostles. If you go back and look in verse uh, 2, all the, command, the commandments given unto the apostles whom he had chosen and whom he had shown after, alive after his passion for 40 days, talking about things pertaining to the kingdom, and then he tells them, you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then Acts 1 verse 8, he said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Who's you? The apostles. And ye, who's that? The apostles shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria to the other part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out, out of their sight, the apostles' sight. And while they, the apostles, looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, both two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, that's the apostles, why stand ye, the apostles, gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you, the apostles, into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye, the apostles, have seen him go into heaven. Uh, so this promise of the Holy Spirit was to the apostles. Now, friends, that... that that is not for us today. It's, it was never commanded. It was never commanded. It did come about, about in Acts chapter 2, but it never was commanded for someone to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, Cornelius is the only exception to the apostles being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he was baptized uh, in the Holy Spirit for the purpose of proving to the Jews that the Gentiles should receive the gospel. And this is what Peter said in Acts 11, verse 15. Peter said, As I begin to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave 
them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I should withstand God? So, yes, there was a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius because Peter said his like on us at the beginning. But that was the only exception. That, that didn't happen to everybody. If it had happened to everybody, why didn't Peter talk about it happening to someone before? Notice he goes all the way back to the beginning. He goes all the way back to the beginning uh, in Acts 2, and he says, this, this is like what it was. Well, why didn't, when he, when he, when he uh, uh, was talking about it, why didn't he say, well, this is like what happened at Samaria in Acts chapter 8? Because nothing had happened like that since the beginning, and nothing had happened like that a sense. So baptism of the Holy Spirit, Holy Holy Spirit baptism was never command, uh, and it only happened twice, and that is in Acts two and Acts ten. So that leaves that leaves one baptism here that we're talking about, and that's the Great Commission baptism. Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is the baptism that's for all mankind. All nations, go and, and teach all nations. Go ye to all the world, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, and Mark 16, verse 15, going to all the world. So whatever this baptism is, it's for everybody, all right? Everybody is supposed to receive this baptism if they want to be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, if I find out what that baptism is, I know what the baptism of the Great Commission was. Now, in Acts 2, verse 38, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So, that's what was preached. That's what was preached. Now, Peter didn't tell them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he didn't say that you had to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, there must be something... There must be another kind of baptism instead of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 22, verse 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, Why tearest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? So there's some, some baptism that is connected to washing away sins. Now, that has to be the one baptism of Ephesians 4, verse 5. A baptism in water, immersion in water, for the remission of sins. Now, James, how do you know that's the one baptism? Well, let's think about this. It can't be the Holy Spirit baptism because in John 1 verse 33, stay with me, John 1 verse 33, John said, I knew him not, talking about Jesus, but he that sent me, that's God, to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Jesus is the one who baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, friends, if I'm supposed to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to be saved, and I never get the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to be saved, and Jesus is the one who is supposed to baptize me with the Holy Spirit, whose fault is it if I'm lost? It has to be Jesus' fault. Now think about that. Jesus died for my sins and then tells me that I have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, which only he can do, and I'm lost? Why would Jesus not baptize me in the Holy Spirit seeing as he died for me to be saved? Why would Jesus go through all the trouble if he wasn't going to baptize me in the Holy Spirit when I needed it? See, it can't be baptism in the Holy Spirit. And besides, notice this. When baptism was preached, it was administered by a man. In Acts 18 and verse 8, now friends, this is one of those, this is one of those side side effects, side benefits that you get from, from doing a good uh, topical study. In Acts 18 and verse 8, Acts 18 and verse 8, the Bible says, this is Paul coming into uh, Corinth. And he says, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Crispus was one of these individuals in Corinth that believed and was baptized. Now, what kind of baptism was that? 
What kind of baptism was it that Crispus uh, uh, submitted to? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul said, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So whatever Crispus had done in Acts chapter 8, verse 18, when he believed and was baptized, Paul said, I baptized him. Well, I know that wasn't Holy Spirit baptism because only Jesus can baptize the Holy Spirit. You see that? So it had to be a baptism in water for the remission of sins because that's the only one that someone like Paul could administer. So here's what I know about baptism now. I know that it's a burial. I know it takes water. I know it takes much water. You have to go down into the water. I know that if it's in connection with the preaching of the gospel and it is obeyed, it is for the remission of sins. Now, you have to stop and think. There were a lot of other baptisms, a lot of other baptisms that were going on in these days. In Hebrews 9 and verse 10, the Bible says, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings, diverse baptisms, all these different kinds of baptisms. Now, the Jews knew there were a whole lot of different baptisms. They were familiar with all kinds of washings, purified ritual washings and so forth. And that's why in Act, in 1 Peter 3.21, Peter said, it's not the putting away of the filth of flesh, he knew somebody might be confused with all these different kinds of baptisms and washings that were floating around and, and uh, being uh, used and participating in. He said, no, the baptism I'm talking about is not one of washing away the filth of flesh. It's not some ceremonial cleansing. What I'm talking about, the baptism that saves, the like figure of being saved by water in baptism that doth also now save us, it's the answer for good a conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's only one burial, there's only one baptism where you're buried and can be raised with Christ, and that is from the water and grave of baptism. And that's the baptism that everybody must submit to. That's the baptism that is part of the Great Commission. That is the baptism that you and I must submit to if we want to be saved. So, yeah, there are many baptisms in the Bible, but there's only one that's commanded. There's only one that's commanded and then must be submitted to. That is, after a person hears the gospel, after they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8, 24, if they repent of their sins, Acts 17, and verse 30, 31, and then uh, confess Christ before man, Acts chapter 8, 36 and 37, they can say, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And if you have confessed Christ, you've repented of your sin, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, guess what? Then you can stop the chariot and you can go down into the water and be baptized to wash away your sins. All right? That is the command that justifies God. If you obey that command, then you get to justify God. In other words, you're saying God is going to be just and righteous because I have done what he said for me to do. Now, friends, just a little study on baptism, just a little study on baptism will tell you one more thing about it. The baptism that people did in order to be saved, they never put off. They never waited. The Great Commission baptism was never put off. It was always immediate. In Acts 16, they baptized the jailer the same night. Why tarest thou rise and be baptized and wash away the sins? Same, same night, same day, same hour. And friends, if you're part of a church that says, well, we're going to have a baptism you know, next month, third month, whatever, they don't, they don't teach Bible baptism the way the Bible says. But in the Lord's church, that's what they do. Friends, I'm out of time. I've got about 30 seconds. So let me tell you, friends, if you want to study more like this and get, get down and get all the verses and come to a conclusion about what the Bible is saying, you need to come visit the Church of Christ. We uh, uh, will be glad to see you. My name is James Ofield. This is the Word of the Lord. If you can reach me at 276-340-2653. Thanks for listening. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. God bless. Have a good night.